Hi everyone, uh, hopefully you can hear us okay. Uh, we are just about to kick off the IR35 webinar. Uh, so you're you're live with myself, Charlie Wood, and Graham Cox. Hi there. Uh, and we're just gonna be talking you through the IR35 payroll working uh, changes for the private sector. So we're gonna give people one more minute uh, just to, to log on and uh, Hopefully, we'll be able to kick off in a minute. Uh, if you can, uh, if anybody wants to drop a quick note to let us know they can hear us okay, uh, you can add a note into the chat section. Excellent. Thanks very much, David. Uh, great stuff. Okay. So we'll kick off just now then. Uh, today, we're going to be talking through the, the changes. We're going to take you through a brief history of IR35. I know there are some people who uh, aren't as familiar as others with it. Uh, we'll talk through the IR35 assessment criteria. Um, we'll go through the off-payroll working rules, uh, timelines and changes what we suggest that everyone does now and what we think is going to happen over the next uh, 12 to 24 months. So kicking off with a history of IR35. Hi everyone. So I think most might know IR35 isn't a new thing. IR35 legislation was originally introduced in April 2000. It was introduced to deter the use of PSCs to facilitate disguised employment, but over the years, the policy hasn't been particularly effective. HMRC perceive widespread non-compliance, and they don't have the resource to police PSC by PSC, losing something like 80% of cases that have brought to court. So fast forward to a couple of years ago, uh, the 6th of April 2017, Changes to the off-payroll rules were introduced to all public sector assignments involving a PSC. Some of the changes at that point included responsibility for determining the status moving to the end hirer and responsibility for deducting tax and national insurance from payments to the PSC found inside IR35, then moved to the fee payer, often known as us, the agency. So it was at that time, uh, rumours started to circulate about the implementation into the private sector. And in May 2018, there was consultation to consider the rollout via 35 changes into the private sector. We now find ourselves here, and in July 2019, draft legislation for off-payroll working in the private sector was published. Okay. So the IR35 assessment criteria. Um, I just want to check uh, that everybody can hear me again. Just give a thumbs up if you can hear okay. Uh, I see Anna's mentioned that it's gone quiet, so I want to make sure that's uh, just a, a one-off and hopefully it's fixed for Anna now. Uh, the IR35 assessment criteria uh, are basically the, the important bits. This is uh, how everybody is uh, actually assessed against IR35, how HMRC um, should be determining your status. Um, and it, R35 is, is tax legislation that's actually based on employment law. And this is where it gets really tricky. Um, employment law is all about painting a picture. So if you're self-employed or a disguised employee, it's about painting a picture of your working practices and the way you engage with your end client. Um, it's not clear cut, it's not binary, and this is why HMRC struggles so much with it. So the the first one is about uh, right to substitute. It's whether or not you're providing a personal service. Now, if it's a, a contract for services, then you should have the right to substitute yourself out. Uh, a really good example of uh, right to substitute in action is uh, that of a plumber. If you phone uh, a self-employed plumber up uh, saying you've got an issue with your boiler, uh, you won't know really whether it's that person that turns up to fix it or not, and nor do you care. Uh, as long as uh, somebody is is there who's got the right skills who can do the job. So that's that's the ideal situation for substitution. So it's whether or not a 
a PSC can substitute um, an individual out for another that would run through that PSC. The second main criteria for assessment is direction, supervision and control. Now, there's always going to be some element of direction, supervision and control in any contractual relationship. Uh, if you take the example of one of the, the big four, one of the consultancies, uh, there's still elements of direction, supervision and control with an end client. Uh, they still have to report in. So direction, supervision and control is once again about painting that picture is how much control, you know, a, is the end client dictating exactly where, what, and how, and the how is the important bit, work is delivered and done. So it's about measuring that supervision, direction, control. Um, the third one is, is the one that HMRC have struggled with the most over the years, and that's mutuality of obligation. Now, HMRC's definition of mutuality of obligation is that if there's a contract that infers there's mutuality of obligation. Um, the courts disagree and employment law states that mutuality of obligation must be based on a future state. So is the end client obliged to provide uh, the contractor with work in the future? And is said contractor obliged to undertake that work? Uh, in many cases, mutuality of control, uh, sorry, mutuality of obligation is the one that is missing from a lot of these. But remember, this is all about painting a picture. You can have no mutuality of obligation, um, but you could still have supervision, direction, control, and it could still be a personal service. You might not have the right to substitute, in which case it suggests it would be inside as an assessment. Uh, the fourth one there is financial risk. Uh, so is there a financial risk for the contractor, uh, for the PSC? Um, are they... Uh, having to rectify mistakes uh, under their own, uh, well, at their own expense, do they uh, have to, if, if a mistake is made, do they have to work over a weekend to rectify things? Um, and whether or not um, there's any skin in the game, do they have any issues with, uh, you know, completion of milestones, is there a financial risk, is there a, a bonus that they could lose out on? Um, that's the, the financial risk model. And that is another large part of it. Uh, the two at the end are less important these days. Those are the four main assessment criteria for assessing whether somebody's self-employed or falls inside the IR35 rules. Um, but are you on, in business on your own account? Do you have an office? Do you operate your business and advertise your business as services your business provides? Um, do you supply your own equipment, for example? Now, the equipment piece is less important these days due to the uh, information security rules that a number of uh, end clients have, whereby they don't actually allow external equipment on site. Um, but running your own business as a contractor is still an important part of this. Uh, and the last one is, are you part and parcel? So if you're a contractor on site, are you easily identifiable as that, as an individual PSC providing services to an end client? Would uh, those that you're working with be able to identify you? Now, this can be little things as simple as a lanyard, change of colour, um, but it's also about how you behave in terms of office parties, uh, Christmas parties. You shouldn't have an invite to a Christmas party, and if you do, you should be paying your own way. And actually, you can expense that through your business. So it, part and parcel is all about how you interact with that business, whether you're a part of the furniture or not. So the off-payroll working timeline and changes. So future IR35 timeline. Now, November 2019, I think as of last week, uh, we should have had the off-payroll working in the private sector legislation confirmed. Uh, it was part of the Chancellor's budget, but with no budget in sight, we now find ourselves facing a general election, which has been confirmed for the 12th of December. One of the questions we're getting at the moment, and I think it might actually pop up at the end of this, um, with the general election now confirmed, is do we think that the general election will potentially lead to the changes being shelved or maybe even put on hold for another year or so? It's happened a couple of times with the public sector. Unfortunately, we don't think so. 
the Treasury are expecting over three billion in additional revenue between 2020 and 2024, uh, and we don't think any government put in place will make a move against that advice or that position. So moving into next year, uh, sometime between January and March of 2020, the legislation will be put forward, be it in the Chancellor's budget or just through the, the normal parliamentary process. Uh, at some point in the next few months, we expect that will pass and we'll then get the full final version of what the legislation will look like. It then takes us to the date that everybody knows, the 6th of April 2020, off payroll working and the private sector rules will then come into force. So the 2020 changes, and very briefly, apologies to anyone who having technical issues. If you are registered for this webinar, you will be able to get access to the recording at any time by following the same link. So hopefully you'll still be able to listen to it if uh, there, there are technical problems at your end. Um, so in terms of the 2020 changes then, um, the biggest one is that end hirers will be responsible for assessing IR35 status for each individual contractor. So for uh contractors who up to, up until now have been responsible for determining whether they're inside or outside of ir35 this is a, a massive change um uh, and unfortunately it, it is handing uh that uh control of the assessment over to uh, businesses who, who don't really understand the the legislation and haven't had to deal with it before so um in terms of the uh, the changes, uh, an end client must provide a status determination statement, an SDS, directly to the worker and any third parties in the chain. Uh, so the third parties include the agencies. Uh, the SDS must include IR35 assessment decision, along with the rationale for the result. So a, an SDS, it, there's no specification. It could literally be uh, an email saying you are inside and here is why we've determined that that would do as an SDS. There's no set way it needs to be delivered. As long as you have a decision and a rationale behind it, that is the status determination statement. Um, in terms of questions, uh, there will be, there's actually a, an ask a question section, uh, which we'll look to access at the end. Um, so we'll try and save questions until the end, if that's all right. Hopefully we'll cover everything during the, uh, the webinar. If there are any questions at the end, we'll address them then. Um, and obviously, uh, if anyone has any further questions after that, you've got our contact details. So that's the SDS that has to be provided. Um, clients, end clients have to take reasonable care when performing assessments. So there's no official definition yet, and I don't know if we'll actually get one, but based on um, all of our experience in the public sector and the clarifications the HMRC dur made during that implementation, uh, we're confident that we can uh, say that reasonable care involves conducting a comprehensive audit of your existing workforce, uh, including the provision of that SDS now. Um, it will involve having new processes and policies in place to reflect audit outcomes and retaining records of the outcomes and of any changes made as a result of the assessment. Uh, there must be an appeals and dispute process in place. Uh, this was one of the things that came out of the cons consultation earlier in the year that a number of us all, all uh, responded to. Um, and HMRC agreed that there has to be an appeals process for contractors to push back if they disagree with the result. However, HMRC uh, wisely didn't want anything to do with that appeals process and have pushed it back on the end client. So they've, they've said there has to be an appeals process, but that appeals process has to be defined and run by the same end client. So uh, undoubtedly it will go through the same process again and is in all likelihood, unless there's very strong grounds for the, the contractor to push back, I think it will end up in the, the same decision, unfortunately. But that's where we are at the moment. Um, further changes. So tax liability and responsibility for ensuring that appropriate taxes and national insurance contributions are paid falls to the fee payer. So this is the last entity in line um, who pays the PSC. Uh, in our case, it's, it's usually us as an agency, uh, but whoever that last point is who pays the PSC, they're responsible for ensuring that the appropriate taxes uh, and national insurance contributions are paid for anybody who is uh, assessed as being inside IR35. Um, 
transfer of liability is in place as well. So this means that um, if HMRC determined that uh, somebody has been uh, inappropriately uh, badged as outside and they, they successfully win a case against that uh, PSC and claim taxes back, if that PSC, for whatever reason, is unable to pay, then the liability transfers up the chain, uh, say, to the agency involved. If that agency were to go bankrupt, then that liability would transfer up the chain again and end up landing on the end client. Now, it's very, very unlikely that that would actually ever reach the end client. However, uh, because the liability is there, that is seen as a, a risk by uh, those end clients who are very <coughs> risk averse naturally. Um, and therefore, the liability piece has been seen as a, a big driving force behind some of the decisions we're seeing at the moment, which we'll go on to talk about soon. Um, small businesses are excluded. So small businesses are exempt. Uh, that's basically the, the small business definition from the, the 2006 uh companies uh, definition. Um, so that small businesses are um, those businesses that have two out of the three. Um, so an annual turnover of less than 10.2 million is one, a balance sheet total of less than 5.1 million, uh, or average number of employees of less than 50. So if they take two out of those three boxes, they are a small business and they are exempt. Now, this was a fairly easy one for HMRC to, to agree to um, because small businesses generally don't engage with as many contractors. They're after the largest pool they can get in terms of that additional revenue they uh, perceive that they're missing. And so it was a, a relatively innocuous concession on their part. However, it does mean that small businesses out there, um, and there are a very large number, will be able to engage with contractors and those PSCs, those contractors, will still be able to determine whether they're inside or outside. Small businesses don't have to worry about this new legislation at all. Self-employment is not being outlawed and neither is working through a PSC. Uh, though it may feel like it to, to many of you next year, um, self-employment is, you know, HMRC repeatedly say they're not against the self-employed. This is purely addressing issues that they see have been an imbalance and an IR35 um, and because the, the original IR35 legislation didn't work the way they wanted it to, this is them trying to, to create a fix um, for that uh, legislation. Um, and it, it could well work, at least initially. Uh, HMRC's CEST tool, that's Check Employment Status for Tax tool, isn't fit for purpose. Now, they are working on updates. They've said they'll be out by the end of the year from uh, what we're hearing internally. Uh, in HMRC, we, we don't expect to see it before February, but they, they have said that it should be with everybody before the end of the year. The updates that they have uh, mentioned so far have included adding something about mutuality of obligation, which is uh, unsurprisingly missing from the current CES tool. However, we don't believe that CES will be fit for purpose. We don't think it will actually um, do everything that it needs to do. There are a number of third-party tools out there that are more effective for assessing uh, IR35 status and are based on case law. So they actually take into account all of the court's uh, rulings and judgments. And that's actually where IR35 rests. It's based on employment law and it is up to the courts to decide whether somebody is breaking the law or not. So it's tax legislation based on employment law, hence why it doesn't really work. Uh, HMRC have said they will not look backwards, unlike in 2017. Now, when the uh, 2017 changes came into the public sector, there were cases of HMRC knocking on doors of contractors and saying, well, look, your status has changed from outside to inside. Uh, you've been with that end client for two years. We think you owe us tax for those two years, and we're going to pursue that. They have said and stressed that they will not be looking backwards in this instance. Um, they've stopped short of saying that it is an amnesty, however. Uh, the latest update uh, with consultation in October, uh, they confirmed that they'll not look backwards unless they consider there to have been significant criminal or fraudulent behaviour. Now, that should reassure everyone. However, it, it does 
bring into question what the taxman considers to be criminal behaviour. Um, and if you think there has been uh, uh, tax avoidance, uh, purposeful tax avoidance, you may, as a taxman, consider that to be criminal behaviour. So we're waiting to see how this plays out. Uh, I do think we need to take them at their word that they won't look backwards, but based on you know previous performance, it's a pinch of salt, unfortunately. So, what to do now? Um, and this is uh, the the big part for you guys, I suppose. Is what's our, our advice for you? Um, so, right now, understand the law and the changes coming. Um, obviously, there's a lot more to it than we can go into in an hour long webinar. Uh, but having a very strong understanding of IR35, of its history, of the criteria, and actually the case law and the precedents around the case law uh, that set it. Uh, put you in a very good place to to be able to talk authoritatively about it, both with your end hirers, your end clients, um, and with anybody else in the, the chain. Uh, engage with your agency and end client to gain an understanding of their strategy and implementation plan. So we're at the mercy to an extent of our end clients. Uh, there are a number of them that we, uh, we are working with, but it's mainly the SMEs um, and we're working with them to ensure that they uh, perform assessments properly, that they go down the right route. Um, unfortunately, as many of you are aware, uh, the, the larger corporates will make these decisions on their own. They'll take advice, but they ultimately it will be a, a board uh, decision that will be made. And usually it's based on what they perceive as least risk, uh, both risk to the business and risk publicly um, and financially. Uh, and, you know, based on liability and risk, a number of them are sidestepping the issue. We'll go on to talk about that um, towards the end of the webinar. Um, but, yeah, at the moment, have a, a talk to your end clients. If they haven't made a decision yet, um, make sure you're voicing your opinions and making your opinions heard in a constructive way. Uh, and we will hopefully see uh, more and more end clients over the next few months uh, making the decision to assess properly and using a tool in addition to CEST, uh, which, as we've discussed already, isn't fit for purpose. Audit your limited company business practices. Um, so contractors haven't really needed to ensure that they are behaving in the right ways and that they're working in the, the right ways with end clients because IR35 um, disappeared for a number of years. It, it wasn't fit for purpose. Uh, HMRC lost the majority of cases um, and it, it wasn't addressing the problem that they thought it should. So they almost gave up on it until they came up with this brilliant plan. Um, so make sure that you're running your limited company as a business. Um, you know, how do you market yourself? Do you uh, attend any networking events? Do, are you online networking? And is it as a business? Um, do you have a, an office, even if it's a home office? Um, you know, do you market yourself online as a business as well as somebody with those skills? Uh, and that is important moving forwards. I think one of the positives that will come out of all of this is in a couple of years, we will be in a position where uh, those who are contracting as outside are very clearly defined as outside. Um, and business practices have been amended to reflect that. Uh, Calculate the minimum rate you'd be willing to accept for roles inside IR35. Now, we'll talk about this again at the end, but a lot of roles are going to be inside next year. Um, there will be a lot of roles that are umbrella only. So make sure you're aware of the impact that it would have um, and what rates you would be willing to accept. What is the minimum that you need uh, to facilitate the lifestyle that you want? Uh, and is that feasible? Um, is it, you know, for some people it will be that actually initially they might be better off looking at permanent positions. However, I think for the majority it will still be uh, more lucrative and more financially viable and, and also in, in working practices better for them to carry on as contractors. So have a look at rates uh, inside, have a look at rates from umbrellas. Identify relevant, similarly skilled potential substitute in, substitutes in your network be willing to work through your uh, PSC should the need to substitute arise. So this is something we're recommending all contractors do and many of you will have worked with uh, like-minded, similarly skilled contractors 
uh, in your network, and it's maybe about formalizing that. So being able to produce a list of 10 contractors with a very similar skill set that you could have as your substitute should the need arise should help with uh, some companies in terms of assuaging any any concerns and, and worries about that right to substitute clause. Uh, review both contracts and working practices against the IR35 legislation. Um, at Head Resourcing, we get ours uh, reviewed biannually uh, by Kudos and by our lawyers to ensure that they are as IR35 friendly as they can be. Um, but you know, contracts that you have with others, um, working practices that you have, make sure you're you're getting expert advice on that and making sure that uh, if you are deemed outside, that everything is outside and is as should be. Uh, decide on your approach to inside R35 roles, should you be willing to engage. So this is, and we'll talk about it uh, later on, but the new normal next year is going to be inside or via umbrella, certainly to begin with. Um, that's the way the market is going at the moment. I don't see that changing. So it's about having that um, view in mind and looking at, well, would you want to go PAYE via an agency? Would you be happy going umbrella? Um, or would you want to go via a deemed employee model whereby you can still utilize your uh, limited company, um, but via an agency under PAYE? So the agency would... Uh, basically take off any uh, tax national insurance contributions before giving the the net to your limited company. Um, a number of people have asked why some companies might want to do that. They might want to do that if they believe that they are going to successfully challenge an inside IR35 ruling, or they might want to do that if this is a, a short term, a three month engagement and the majority of their roles they foresee as being outside. So that deemed employee bit is, is something worth looking at. However, depending on how you run your limited company, it can mean that some some of that net revenue is taxed twice. So it's, it's not the most cost effective way to go about it. Okay. Can you just advice to, to, uh, to clients? Speak to the bullets, please. Yeah. Yep. So I just thank you very much. There we go. So uh, advice to clients, an area that for those that know Charlie has spent a lot of time in, is still spending a lot of time in and, and doing a lot of work in. So we're only five months to go. The the kind of I guess the message right here right now is don't wait to act. Get on it. Get moving. Uh, understand the law, really get under the bonnet of it. We're trying to encourage as many clients to to try and think about being out, fully understand it, continue that proper engagement with with the limited company contractors and PSC. So uh, alongside that, set up a change programme. They need to be able to react to the change and be ready to, to adopt the new legislation, basically. Uh, they need to engage with, the part, uh, with all parties involved and be speaking to us and you, talking to the whole supply chain and all other off-payroll workers about how best to manage the rules and define a suitable assessment process for the current contractor population, whilst also looking at internal processes for assessing the future requirements that are likely to come up. We've been encouraging them to begin an audit to fully understand the current profile of their off-payroll workforce, and how they're currently engaged, and therefore the change, the, the scale of the change that will be managed. Sorry. So they need to rag status the flexible workforce so that they can understand the impact of any loss of resource we'd have. And we're also telling them to gain an understanding of the potential financial impact that an inside classification would make to their contractors and whether or not they would be prepared to increase any would be prepared to increase any day rates, sorry, to mitigate the impact of that. So for, particularly for those sidestepping the issues by removing PSCs from the supply chain, it's a very popular, uh, a very popular thing in the financial sector, as as most people know at the moment. They need to understand the impact of insisting that contractors engage through an umbrella or as PAYE. The impact in this space is less than it used to be a few years ago, but obviously for take-home numbers and for the contractors trying to obviously work to certain figures. There is still a, a, a hit in that space and the uh, sorry, the hiring clients themselves, they need to understand that. So again, we're trying to advise in that particular area. We're also advising that they need to develop their internal processes for assessing the future requirements, as mentioned above. Um, will the SDS, the status determination statement, be produced at the same time as the business case and sign-off, for example? 
They need to begin to develop their assessment appeals uh, process, as Charlie talked about slightly earlier. And finally, they need to assess future supply models for interim and flexible resource and put in place the supplier agreements to facilitate the appropriate solutions. Can I just ask everybody, see before we move into conclusion and just Charlie's final bit, is everybody still okay hearing us? A couple of thumbs up would be good if that's all right. Yeah, apologies again to anybody who struggled with some of the tech. Uh, but hopefully we still have some of you. Excellent Thank you, stuff. Shirley. Thank you. And also, can I just ask you if you've got questions now, uh, can you start to maybe populate them in the ask a question section and we'll try and get, get on to that? Yeah, so you can, uh, at the bottom of your screen, you should see ask a question and you should be able to click on that and type your question in there. Thank you. So what do we think will happen next? Uh, so as Graham mentioned, there are a number of end hirers who are opting out of the process entirely. Now, whilst we don't agree with the the stance that they're taking, um, I, I personally totally understand it. If you've got uh, a couple of hundred, even a couple of thousand contractors, the, the assessments are time consuming, um, if you're being given advice by HMRC to use the CES tool and in the you know the next week you see that HMRC are challenging the CES tool in court, you know, you don't know really where you stand as an end hirer. So the tool that you're being advised to use by the taxman isn't fit for purpose and it's going to be incredibly costly in terms of time and manpower to assess everybody. It's much easier for them to say, well, actually, if we just remove limited companies and PSCs from our supply chain and insist everybody goes via PAYE or an umbrella, um, we, this is no longer an issue for us. Uh, we don't have to make any assessments. And they're not making a blank, blanket ruling at all. They're not saying that those contractors engaged with them are inside or outside. They're simply saying they won't be dealing with PSCs and therefore avoiding the problem. So, as I said, don't agree with that uh, position, but I do understand why they've taken it. Uh, now, there are going to be some who do assess. Uh, and as soon as one of the larger corporate players uh, comes out and actually assesses properly and has uh, contractors who are assessed inside and contractors who are assessed outside, that will prove to be a game changer over uh, a period of time. So initially, I think the, the new normal is that roles will be either inside IR35 or umbrella or PAYE only, um, the vast majority of roles will be that way. The small companies will still be coming out with roles outside. Uh, the public sector, ironically, uh, have had two years to get used to this, and they're uh, coming out with a, a number of roles uh, that have been assessed as outside. Uh, and there are still SMEs and, and other clients who will be assessing properly and will still have a lot of project work and project-based roles that they're assessing as outside. We've spoken to some clients who are looking at how they can amend their working practices over the next year or so to ensure that by then they have got uh, better working practices to deal with IR35 and that contractors engaged are very clearly outside rather than inside um, due to the working practices at the end client. Now, that's forward thinking. That's great. It is going to happen, but it's going to take time. So I think the market is going to take time to rebalance after this. This is going to be a big bump for everybody. Um, as I say, come March, April, the vast majority of roles that come out will be inside or umbrella only, uh, and it will take time for that to readjust. Um, the light at the end of the tunnel is that we, we've seen the readjustment in the public sector. It has taken a couple of years for them to get used to it. Um, it was a few months before we saw the, the first outside roles come out, but there are more and more now. Um, and by end clients, you know, shifting the way they perceive um, their working practices, by them amending working practices in a healthy way, uh, they will be able to get both inside and outside assessments made and be able to engage with contractors who want to work outside because they are self-employed individuals and that's the right way that they engage. Um, so we do think that whilst there will be a bump next year um, and roles will be inside or umbrella, you know, we need to get used to that as the new normal for a period of time. But in a couple of years, we will have more roles outside as well as some roles still inside. So I, it's not doom and gloom. Um, the other thing to note, uh, and it's 
little consolation, I know, but as Graham mentioned, um, I was very surprised to see it myself, but the uh, the umbrella company take home, whilst it is still a significant hit, is not anywhere near as bad as it was five years ago, um, mainly due to the, the corporation tax and dividend taxes that have been creeping up. Um, but it will still be a viable option for many of you, uh, at least in the interim as the market settles and readjusts. So we'll go on to questions now. I can see we've got uh, a number of questions there. Um, so have Head considered creating an umbrella branch themselves? So uh, we have looked into that, Shirley. It's, so umbrella companies are basically uh, tax and accountancy firms who are uh, running uh, PAYE for uh, groups of uh, individuals on temporary engagements. Um, there, there's actual legislation in place that means that you shouldn't be a recruitment company and an umbrella company at the same time. But we are looking at whether an umbrella company as part of our wider group is something that we should be doing. Um, there are a number of very, very good umbrellas and well-established umbrellas out there. Um, and they are able to offer, due to their size and scale, offer uh, contractors benefits that we wouldn't be able to if we just started an umbrella now. So um, it's something that uh, we are going to keep an eye on, but not something that we've got in plan at the moment. Um, the next question was from uh, David. Uh, so how many of your clients are prepared to increase day rates to cover uh, the move to umbrella companies? Uh, right now, the honest answer, David, is none of them as far as they're communicating. Um, my personal opinion is that rates will adjust over time and we might see a 10% increase to rates over the, the next 12 months to try and compensate for some of the impact. Uh, but unsurprisingly, the end clients who are making the moves to say, well, PSCs aren't going to be in their supply chain. They're all coming out with uh, blanket communications at the moment saying there will be no rate increases. Um, how many of them believe that will remain the case? I, I couldn't tell you. I think many of them are pragmatic and know that there may be exceptions. Uh, particularly, you know, if you, you're a key individual on a piece of work and you you just can't accept the, the impact that's going to happen. I, you know, if you were uh, a contractor engaging with me as an end client, I would be looking to retain you and looking to see what I could do to make that happen. But right now, the policies are there will be no rate increases from uh, all of them. So we'll see how that plays out. Um, so, Manoj, uh, there are a few rules up in market uh, which says outside IR35 with a year contract. Can we trust them? Um, so a year-long engagement, it, the the duration isn't really a factor that is looked into when assessing uh, IR35. Now, if it's a year-long engagement, there's going to be a good business case and a reason for that. And if you think about the duration of many projects and programs, um, they're often more than a year. Um, so I would say a year-long engagement outside IR35 is not an issue as long as there is a queer right to substitute, as long as the working practices reflect how engagement outside engagement should be run um yeah there, there's no harm in that and to be honest it's a sense if i've got a program that i think is going to last two years and i know i need um, a specific resource for at least 12 